Hi and welcome to today's episode of Women's Health Unwrapped. Thank you so much for taking time to join and listen to today's episode. I'm joined today by Dr. Katie Ashcroft, who has over 20 years experience working with adults with mental health difficulties. And Katie and I connected through menopause because her recent research is aiming to give people more information about what is useful in the management of symptoms in peri and post menopause. And Katie's research as she's going to share with us and the work that she's done through her career has really focused on body awareness and emotional regulation when it comes to mental health and this is a really interesting and definitely very important connection that we're going to talk about together today. So welcome to the podcast Katie. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. It's great to have you and you and I chatted just a week ago because we'd connected through one of your students who's working on one of the research projects that we're going to talk about today. So I really enjoyed our initial conversation and I'm looking forward to exploring more of what we started talking about last week. But just to get us started, I'd love to know from you what your most impactful healthy habit is that supports your well-being at the moment. Oh, well, I'm a a recent convert to um, that sort of cardiovascular training um, to to clear the brain fog of menopause. So, um, yeah, I've recently been um, sort of experimenting with that. And I suppose I'm in the process of working out how to kind of get it into my day at the the right point for then kind of doing complicated stuff like designing research projects. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have a favourite type of cardio? Is it the high impact stuff yeah, that you do? Yeah, like the high impact stuff that I do with my personal trainer. You know, it is about really getting that heart pounding, isn't it? And mm. it's just a pity that, the you know, it, the, the fog clears, but it doesn't last days. It only lasts a little <laughs> while. <laughs> yeah, but it is such a great thing to do for lots of reasons isn't it you know sometimes yeah. it's it's just that way of switching off from the stresses of normal life to be in the zone because when you are pushing yourself quite intensely that in itself is very mindful because you you just focusing on the the challenge of the workout aren't you yeah you can't really think about much else which is mm-hmm. which can be really helpful yeah brilliant so i'd love to start with just having you explain Katie some of what you do and and what you've worked on in your career that's led you to where you are now. Sure yeah so I'm a clinical psychologist um, which means that I'm trained um, to sort of work with people with mental health difficulties so a clinical psychologist tend to do the, the kind of the talking therapy stuff we leave the the medication to to the psychiatrists and so early on in my career, I specialised in working with people with, with very severe and long-term difficulties, lots of uh, people with psychosis and schizophrenia. And then I worked in an early intervention service, so with people experiencing their first episode of, of psychosis. And there's plenty of research in, in that population about how important physical health is and, and how that can really deteriorate when you've got that diagnosis. Um And then for the past 10 years, I've been doing more of my clinical work in terms of working with people with um, more anxiety and depression. And over that time, there's been a kind of a couple of really important themes that have come out of it. Um, Firstly, I guess what I'm seeing a lot is um, people not really having um, much awareness of when they're becoming anxious only kind of noticing it when they've got really anxious, but also not having the, the tools and the skills to, to deal with that. And of course, anxiety is a very physically based thing, isn't it? It's that sympathetic mm. nervous system kind of really getting switched on and, and starting to take over. Um, and then, of course, the, the pandemic kind of had a, a big impact on my practice because you, know, you couldn't see people face to face. Um and lots of people were working from home. Um, and as I was still working with my clients on the phone or remotely, we were kind of really noticing what they were struggling with because they weren't in the office environment. They didn't have those kind of supportive other people around. They didn't have that nice sort of 
hubbub of background noise that actually kind of felt quite useful in terms of keeping them in a zone where they they didn't panic or completely switch off. They didn't feel too overwhelmed by their work. And for each person, we sort of worked out what was going on. And I really started to understand at a, at a much more kind of detailed level, kind of the impact of having other people around to to regulate your autonomic nervous system, your, you know, whether you were in fight or flight or whether you were kind of calm, connected and can concentrate on your work. Um, and so I suppose what I've been kind of focusing on in the last sort of six or more years is this sort of um, need for improving people's awareness of their bodies, like tuning back into your body rather than always being distracted by whatever's on your phone or whatever else you, you can consume um, and man- being more effective in managing our bodies. And of course, that, that you can come at that from so many different angles, can't you? Because mm. what's also really important is our menstrual health or where we are yeah, with uh, our menopause journey. Um, and, and so I started to realise through personal experience and talking to lots of friends and colleagues just what a tough time a lot of us were having uh, with menopause and how it, how it was having an impact on us. Um, and so I wanted to start to kind of marry all my kind of strands of um, experience and research up um, to, to think about un- understanding where we are in our cycle or with our menopause um, and the impact that can have on our mental health. Because the idea that, you know, a scientist can just take our brain out and pop it in a jar and that's us separate from our body is, isn't a very helpful one. Um, <laughs> it sort of suggests that, that you know, we, we are something completely separate to our body, but, you know, our body is the... The, the grounding in which our kind of our mental health uh, and our psychology sits. And so just wanting to kind of really kind of understand and layer that up more and more. And so that's what I tend to work on uh, with the, the people I work with now who are biologically female in terms of understanding uh, all the different contributing factors that can go into mental health difficulty. Um, but one of those in- includes uh, our physiology and particularly uh, our, our kind of menstrual or, or our health or, or our menopause journey. Mm. And, and that was where you and I really kind of started geeking out last week because yeah. I love this this <laughs> side of things, both because of what I do in my coaching work, but also because of my own journey, I started to have very severe anxiety and panic attacks when I was 19 and I'm a very logical process uh, person very process driven and for me this was back in 1995 there was no talk of mental health really back then you know even in, Mm. in terms of what I discussed with the doctor and I did see a psychiatrist as well because what I was struggling with was pretty extreme and Mm. for me i believed there had to be something inherently wrong in my brain and like what you've explained there many of us see the brain and and mind as being its own thing and separate to the rest of the body and so I was then having very physical things happen like palpitations or you know the rapid breathing or actually pain or stomach you know gut um, I'd start to need the toilet and so on. Mm. And so to me, they they were there, those things. They weren't related to what was going on in the brain. You know, I'd, I'd completely separated them out and spent many, many years looking for a solution for what I thought was wrong in the brain and then separately trying to manage some of those physiological things that took hold and did continue for many years through, mm. you know, the, the health journey that I was on. Mm-hmm. And the biggest biggest kind of awakening for me was only really three um, or so years ago when I started to do the training I've done to work in the health and wellness space was that the mind and body are connected you know and and that was this huge aha moment that I was like (laughs) oh my god you know I did I missed this and if I'd known that earlier and and this is the whole connection isn't you're now 
explaining here with the mental and physical health that many of the patients you've seen, especially those female patients that have mental health struggles, it's often and and probably almost always in some way related to what is happening from a physical sense as well. And our hormones do play such a role in how we are physically full stop. So especially as you said, as those born biologically female, you know, we have very, very unique hormonal cycles Mm. from puberty through our reproductive years, which then change in menopause. So that brings us nicely to the research projects that you have two of your current students recruiting for, which are related to menopause, because you've found that this is a very important connection to look further into to help people when you are working with them on those psychological mental aspects of the health so tell me a little bit more about that yeah absolutely so yeah I think what I've noticed is from working with a variety of different people is you know understandably people want to to handle the menopause in in the way that's going to suit them and I guess my commitment is to trying to ensure that we have as much really good information as possible, data-driven information, uh, to help people make those decisions. Um, because um, as clinical psychologists, we do, we do love data. We are scientists <laughs> by, <laughs> by training. And so we, you know, we like some hard facts to back up an idea. Um, and I felt that people were making decisions potentially with not a lot of information about what was actually going to be useful for them. And so because um, I work on the doctorate in clinical psychology at Royal Holloway, I part of my job is supervising trainees to do their research project, which is part of their training. It felt like a great opportunity to um, do some nice research on on menopause. And so we've got two studies running at the moment. So the really nice thing about working at Royal Holloway is that I get to supervise the trainees' research projects as part of their qualification. Uh, And Emma approached me. She's had a long-term interest in women's health and menopause because of, you know, family experience, etc. And she was really eager to do her project on menopause and, like me, concerned that women had good data on which to to base their choices. So Emma Dooley's doing a project where we're looking at using this app to help you improve your heart rate variability. So what it does is it gives you sort of live feedback about how you're improving your heart rate variability by changing your breathing. And heart rate variability is really interesting. So the the higher your heart rate variability, the the greater your emotional resilience. Um, And it fluctuates as part of the menstrual cycle. And obviously it can deteriorate uh, for a number of reasons. And I guess what we're hoping is that by looking at this heart rate variability by feedback training, um, we're giving people, um, as I say, live feedback so that they can uh, more effectively improve their heart rate variability. And that study um, means that, unfortunately, if you drink more than 14 uh, units of alcohol a week or more, then you, um, I'm afraid you can't participate because uh, that amount of alcohol does have a negative impact on your heart rate variability. Mm. Um, and what we're doing with both studies is we're using a single case experimental design, which I have to say I'm rather excited by because it... It allows us to recruit a kind of a small number of people, but to really look in detail at each person's experience. Um, it does mean that um, you need to kind of fill something in every day uh, and also kind of a few more questions once a week. And we're going to look at tracking how things are for you a few weeks before you do the training, whilst you do it, and then for a few weeks afterwards. I'd love to, Katie, just to... Um... For you to expand a little bit on heart rate variability, because I would presume a lot of people listening don't know what that is. I did speak about it on the podcast actually almost two years ago with someone and that it was completely new to me at that point. But I'm now hearing so many people speak about it and lots of celebrities who are tracking it because I think it's obviously quite new and a bit of a trend thing. And I think it's something that 
could potentially be very, very interesting for our future way of, of building stronger health. Yeah. So imagine that you've got two circles. You've got your sympathetic nervous system, the red circle, the fight or flight, and the green circle, your parasympathetic nervous system, the rest, digest, be calm, you know, comfortable and connected to other people. When you breathe in, it's red circle activation, it's sympathetic nervous system. When you breathe out, it's parasympathetic nervous system, so it's constantly changing. And if you breathe at a rate of six breaths a minute or slower with a longer out breath, then you're getting more green circle, you're getting more calm activation. And obviously that can be really useful to know and understand and practice because it can help you deal with when you're starting to feel slightly anxious. Mm. And the more skilled you get at it, the more you can use it in even trickier situations. It's a bit like learning to swim. You need to kind of paddle around in the shallows beforehand and practice before able to do it kind of in the deep end with the wave machine on. Yeah. Oh, it sounds so interesting. And so Kate, so Kate, um, Emma's working on this project, Katie, and she's going to track women through a period of time. How long will that, that be, that they'd be working on tracking their heart rate variability? Yeah, so it's about... So we're going to randomly allocate people to whether it's two weeks or three weeks of, of measurement before you do the study. So the, the length of the study varies slightly. Mm. And then it's an eight-week intervention. And then we've got a few weeks follow-up. <clears throat> so it is a commitment for a few months. But if you're really interested in having that feedback and being able to do that training a couple of times a day for three minutes, then it might be a study you'd like to sign up for or at mm. least have a look at in more detail. Yeah, and three minutes a day is nothing really. And it, this is all with an objective of trying to look at different ways women can be positively impacted through their menopause experience, but also to see how that shift in their health, because of something they're doing physically, can positively affect their mental health. Is that the whole perspective yeah. that they're we're, doing well we're wanting from. to track the symptoms that are important to the women mm -hmm. and also your ability to regulate your emotions because certainly that can deteriorate for some women um mm. during menopause we you know you can have that sort of instant really angry response can't you apropos of very little so we're thinking that that might be useful for that but to give you an honest answer as to whether it is useful, we need to study it and find out, hence hence that what we've designed. But the idea is to really see how much um, managing your heart rate can help you manage the things that are really bothering you. Mm. Um, and we're quite open-minded as to, to how useful that will be for women who aren't taking HIV. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's something that is quite exciting because – as we've mentioned, that mind-body connection piece is a huge part of how we operate as humans. And so trying to find new ways potentially for women to bring what could be quite simple, not necessarily costly in terms of money or time, habits into their lives to try and help regulate emotions, create better hormone balance and overall have more stronger health I think is is just something that sounds really exciting and has that particular project been done anywhere else or is this a very new project is that why you're particularly excited about it it's not been done anywhere else um mm. there has been quite a bit of research on mindfulness and CBT for menopause so it's kind of in that area mm. but it's something that's a bit new and different which is why we're so excited about it yeah, oh, that sounds great. And so then you have a second project that you're also undertaking with the same objective, which is related to yoga and how that could support menopause. Yeah, exactly. So Brittany McConnell um, is a qualified yoga instructor and really wants to, to bring yoga to, to more people. She's designed a yoga practice that has all the elements of slow movement, calming meditation and breath work. And she's designed it so that you can practice it in the class she's going to run. 
but also maybe take those components into everyday life. Again, with the idea of seeing how useful that is for women to support their menopause symptoms and their emotion regulation. Um, there has been quite a few studies already done on yoga and menopause um, with kind of varying results. But again, we want to take a more detailed look at how it's going to be for a wider range of symptoms using a practice that we're being more specific about and that is tailored for menopause and for kind of learning the bits and applying those bits um, kind of in day-to-day -day life. So you don't have to rip your yoga mat out <laughs> when you're having in the middle of a bad meeting, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you might want to use the, the breath work. And again, um, in that study, we're looking for women who are 40 and over struggling with some menopausal symptoms who aren't on HRT. Um, it's quite a detailed study in terms of looking at daily and weekly measures before the yoga, during doing, um, the weeks you do the classes and afterwards. Because again, we want to be really clear about how things are for women for a few weeks beforehand and then during the study, and then whether those effects last. Yeah, and I would personally love to be involved in both of them, but I have been on HRT for a year, because I think yeah. they're just so fascinating. And also knowing how many women are struggling in those early stages of perimenopause, especially when things can become very disruptive and you're trying to work out what's going on and adjust to some of those changes. I think either one of these could bring benefit. And I know we can't assume that because that's what you do as scientists and, and what the research is about. But I think, it, you know, if anything, it's going to give you an opportunity to bring some pause and time for you, which in itself can be very positive and something that not many women are able to achieve usually. So if you are interested in being part of either of these research projects and you are listening to the podcast when it's out in October or soon after. I'm going to pop all of Katie's details in there. You can reach out directly to Katie or to myself and we can share more information and then you can connect with both or either of Emma or Brittany to see, uh, you know, if there's still space and how you can get involved. So I'm really excited about what you can find out or, or will find out once the, the projects are complete. But one of the things I'd mentioned to you when we spoke initially, Katie, was that I just think it's really positive that you have these young women who have chosen to use menopause for their projects in their, in their studies, you know, and, and in their training to be clinical psychologists. So was that something that surprised you? Because Obviously, we're trying to reduce you know, this traditional story we have that menopause is an older woman's problem. Like, were they excited? Was it something that they had come up with themselves? Was there a reason why they chose menopause? Yeah, very much so. So, um, yeah, I mean, both Brittany and Emma are 30, but, mm -hmm. but have an eye to, to women's health and the kind of the complicated recipe that each of us needs to work out throughout our lives to you know for us to kind of feel as good as we can and and do what we want to do so it wasn't a surprise but it's always a pleasure to have trainees who are really interested in doing innovative things and and then put all that hard work in mm. um, and obviously what we hope to do is share our findings in with lots of different people having run the studies so watch this space as to what the results are. Yeah, and obviously there's so much happening in the menopause and women's health space, it, although it seems, I think, a lot when we're in that space, but it's all very much needed and we need more rapid progression and insights into what can support women. And so, yeah, I think it'd be very interesting to see what the results are and then how your team is able to share these with other organizations and people who are involved in the menopause space to get some attention and spotlight on hopefully what are very positive and and hopeful findings yeah absolutely and then of course it'll be straight on to what the next project is to, kind of, <laughs> to build on on the understanding Mm, absolutely. So just to kind of think about that top down approach when we do think about our minds and, and the brain and how that part of our anatomy works together with the rest of it. 
when you've or or in your experience of working with with many females at different stages of their life do you say that you know their hormones are playing a role in their emotional regulation and onwards their mental health yeah it's different for each person but we you know we try and look at all the different contributing factors and a lot of women won't really um, be tracking their cycle or having to think about how much it, it affects them. And so it's something that I would ask them to do when they start therapy as well as reviewing what they're eating and how they're sleeping and mm. how much alcohol they're drinking. And yeah, I guess the way that I sort of always explain it is that you know, there's no point doing the kind of fancy psychological work if those basics aren't in place. If you're not getting enough sleep, if you're not uh, eating well, if you're not kind of understanding where you are in your cycle um, and, and what you need at that point. So, yeah, it's it's a top down approach in terms of the psychology, but it's also this really important bottom up approach in terms of the, the pure physiology and, and how the two intertwine. So I know you were asking me, for sort of my three tips for kind of mm. forming a, a healthy habit. And I guess I, w- I would really encourage people to just spend, even if it's just a minute each day, tuning into your body and having a, a kind of a little check-in as to how you're feeling and what your body might need, rather than just kind of pushing on and ignoring it and being a bit frustrated when your body's giving you some feedback. I'd suggest you were you know, try being kind to your body. It is the vessel that allows you to do all these things. And so it's okay if you give it a little bit of time and a little bit of thought. But yeah, that's such a great tip. And so what, what would be two other tips then that somebody could take to help them build that habit to be more connected mind and body? So I'd also kind of um, encourage people to, well, if you notice some kind of anxiety um, or anger, you notice that red circle that sympathetic nervous system getting going you know yes you might need to distract yourself from it if you're in the middle of a supermarket doing doing your shop but maybe actually what your body needs is a little bit of calming down and so thinking about what you can use to do that that works for you bearing in mind that you might have to practice something for a little while before you get good at it before you're going to be use it when you'll be able to use it and and bring yourself down from feeling really panicky and I suppose my third tip, <clears throat> excuse me, would be just practice six breaths a minute. It's okay if you can't do six breaths a minute at first. Lots of people can't, unless you're a runner or a, a wind instrument player. But but improving your heart rate variability by practicing every day just for a few minutes, breathing at a rate of six breaths a minute with a longer out breath and in breath is a good sort of foundation stone to mm. to managing that overactive and over enthusiastic fight or flight response brilliant so six breaths a minute that's 10 seconds essentially a breath and so are you breathing in through the nose and then out for longer through the mouth yeah you can or is it all nasal breathing for you. both right. both can be nose but mm-hmm. yeah you want a longer out breath than in breath mm. um and there's all kinds of nice little apps um, you can use to do that. And what I get my clients to do is to really overlearn that skill, to practice it every day in lots of different situations. Hey, this, this age group is my age group in terms of remembering the old martini advert, anytime, any place, anywhere. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the more you practice it in lots of different situations, the more likely you are to remember it in all those different situations when you actually need it, when you're starting to feel a bit anxious. Whereas if you've only practiced it sat on the sofa at home, you'll only remember it then Mm. because of context-dependent memory. So practice it in lots of different places, practice it every day. Um, And then when you're starting to feel a bit anxious, it might be something that's useful for you to use to to calm yourself down. And as you Mm. get more skilled, you can do it when you're doing other things. But the only thing that you can't do it with at the same time is is when you're talking but you know you you will be able to start uh, being able to do it when you're listening to somebody and what you're doing is turning on the vagus nerve 
to, to grow the green circle, the parasympathetic nervous system, to be in a calmer place. And that is the place we need to be in to, to connect with other people, but, you know, even to, to do the shopping list as well as something more complicated at work. Mm, fantastic. And it's funny, last night I was out with some ladies who I'm in a growth accountability group with, and we had been working on our Q4 goals and we were together sharing what we're working on. And one of the goals that I have has a step to help achieve that goal, which is about meditating, because that's a habit that I haven't successfully formed. I think I have Mm -hmm. quite a few mindful habits, but having that space and pause is one that I'm regularly working on and then trying to come back to because I haven't stuck to it. And so actually what you've said there about the six breaths a minute, I think could be quite a good fit for helping me to achieve that in Q4. And one of the ways that I'm going to do that, Katie mentioned apps, is I'm going to use a habit tracking app, a free one, to put that in there. So maybe if I start off with just two times a day, doing those one minute each and and measuring that, and then in November I could up that to maybe three or four minutes a day. And so it is really starting small, isn't it? But I love how you've explained that as well in terms of doing it in those different places so that you do form that memory for the habit of breathing wherever it is because whether you're out on a walk or you're driving in the car or you're sitting working at a desk to have just that minute of conscious connected breathing in that way I think is is something that's very powerful and when we help ourselves to remember to do it initially to build that habit I think it will be really uh, easy to do. So thanks for sharing those. Yeah, You're very welcome. And as I say, it's okay if you can't do it that slowly at first. Practice Mm -hmm. at at what you can practice at, which is often eight or nine breaths a minute. Do that for a week and then drop drop it down one and just take your time to to get to six. Yeah. And and thinking about it in in the 10 second blocks of four in, six out, Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, but... So I think when you're doing it intentionally, it could be quite easy to do that way. But then, as you said, starting to to more regularly, naturally breathe six times a minute. And I know there's a great um, breathwork expert, James Nestor, who talks about this Mm -hmm. a lot. And I'm sure I've heard him talk about the amount we breathe per minute and how dysregulated we've become as humans Mm -hmm. to our breath and how that's very much a part of what we're seeing in the rising ill health and so on so yeah that's another really fascinating area alongside the heart well linked to the heart rate variability yeah absolutely mm. no he's his book's great isn't it I, I haven't read his book I've listened to him on some podcasts and I find him fascinating to listen to he, he's got such a uh, kind of an addictive voice to to hear and then the way that he explains things is really helpful as well So it's been brilliant chatting, Katie. And just to refresh everyone with those two projects, if you are hitting those criteria of being over 40, not being on HRT, having some symptoms of perimenopause, or even that you've had a length of time without your period, or perhaps the 12 months in and now at menopause, reach out if you'd like to be a part of either of the studies or, or find out if you are able to take part that would be amazing because the more women we can include in these studies the better the data is going to be the more valuable the findings are hopefully going to be so that we can move forward from whatever is the outcome of of the research projects and use that to help more women going forward yes thank you for your time and of course your expertise Kate it's been brilliant to chat and get to know you a bit more yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's been lovely to catch up. Yeah, you're welcome.